background who we are. And um, sorry, I have a lot of windows open. Okay, exactly who we are and um, how do I play a slideshow? I'm very sorry. Uh, just um, click present in the upper right hand corner. Right. I'm very sorry. Anyway, so um, today we're talking about um, escaping coronavirus with Ming Wei Li. And so first of all, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, our schedule is that we're going to be doing this little intro for about five minutes, then we'll have the discussion, and then we'll have time for a Q&A. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to um, write these in the chat box. I will be keeping a queue throughout the presentation so that at the end, we can return to any questions that um, Ming Wei wants to answer. Um, please mute yourself when you're not speaking just so that there's no noise pollution on the call. Um, and please be, remember to be respectful in the chat and when you're speaking. Um, so what is the API Caucus of Democrats Abroad? In case you don't know, um, Democrats Abroad is the official arm of the Democratic Party for American citizens living outside of the United States. Um, we especially advocate for voting rights of our overseas citizens as every American citizen abroad has the right to vote. Um, the API Caucus was founded in 2020 and aims to represent Asian American and Pacific Islander American issues in Democrats Abroad. Um, we host a lot of fun events. We do film screenings, talks, book clubs, um, more discussions. So if you're interested in any of that, feel free to join us at democratsabroad.org slash API. And if you're not yet a member of Democrats Abroad, but you are an American citizen living abroad, um, feel free to join Democrats Abroad at um, www.democratsabroad.org slash join. All right. So that's all from my end. Anyway, take it away. Okay. I will stop um, sharing my screen so that you can share your presentation. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to my story. My name is Ming Wei Li. I live in Manhattan with my wife and two sons. I moved from Beijing to New York in 2012. I have five siblings, all living near Wuhan, China. My story has three parts. The first part was my trip to China, during which Wuhan COVID-19 broke out, and I was evacuated from Wuhan back in the US. The second part was my 14 days quarantine in a California Air Force base. The third part was my New York COVID-19 crisis experience. I am an artist. I tell my story through my drawings. During the pandemic, I drew over 100 sketches. Today, I'm going to share some of them with you. Part one, Wuhan, China, going into coronavirus. I left New York for China on January 10th. The next morning, because of the jet lag, I woke up very early in Beijing. I was very excited about my hometown, my mother, and the New Year family reunion. I had not spent a Chinese New Year with my mother and siblings, for many years. My father had passed away years ago. This is a view outside the window of my Beijing apartment that morning. After taking care of my business in Wuhan and three other cities, I arrived, I, I, I arrived my hometown on January 19th. Four days later, Right before Chinese New Year, Wuhan was in lockdown. Two days after Wuhan, on the Chinese New Year day, my hometown was in lockdown. Every year, hundreds of millions of people travel back to their hometowns for Chinese New Year family union. In 2020, the number was 300 million. Millions of migrate, migrate workers only meet with their kids once a year during Chinese New Year. Right after Wuhan lockdown, in my hometown, many villagers used the tractors, trucks, fences, 
or ropes to block their village entrances. Many also dug up the road to stop people from traveling. This had not only happened in my hometown, but also in vast numbers of Chinese villages. At that time, every single one of us was shocked, was in disbelief, and it was panic. My family's New Year reunion plan was shattered. One of my sisters is a doctor in my hometown near Wuhan. On the morning of my hometown lockdown, I went to my sister's hospital and I saw her leaders. leader was giving a farewell speech to doctors and the nurses who were sent to support the front line. At the same time, local governments ordered each hospital to send the center numbers of nurses and doctors to the front line. Leaders could have lost their jobs if they could not meet the numbers. In Chinese culture, the first five days of the Chinese New Year are the most important days. On the third day of Chinese New Year, because of the three confirmed COVID cases, my sister's resident community was in lockdown. Her community had 2,300 families without 7,000 residents. With the community lockdown, only authorized persons could get in or out of the community. Only all the foods from the government allowed the supermarkets were delivered at the gate for pickup. The United States began to evacuate its citizens out of Wuhan soon after the crisis. There are two to two evacuations from Wuhan. The first was on January 28th, when nearly 200 State Department employees, their family members, and other Americans were evacuated. The second was on February 4th, when 345 Americans, including me, were evacuated. China government was not happy about the US evacuations. I had a lot of trouble getting my travel pass. On February 4th, I finally had all documents from both the US embassy and the Chinese government for my ev evacuation. Before leaving, I had a farewell lunch with my mother and three of my siblings. Before my departure, we took a group photo at the parking lot. When the United States began its evacuations, I had two choices, stay in China near my mother and siblings, or seek permission to return to US to be with my wife and the children. For anyone who has both the living mother and siblings, but also their own family with children, such choices are agonizing. I elected to return to my hometown in New York City. My mother prepared a wonderful meal of dumplings and fresh vegetables from her own garden for my farewell lunch. She said goodbye to me after lunch and stayed in her house. I understood that she didn't want me to see her tears. When my car was driving away, I turned my head to say goodbye to the place where I spent my childhood and youth. To my surprise, behind the fence of the township government compound, I saw my old mother and one of my sisters standing in the cold wind, watching me going away. My eyes became wet. I turned my head. I couldn't look at them anymore. That was a look I will never forget.
During the city lockdown, I needed a travel pass to go from my hometown to Wuhan airport. My sister's name was also on the pass as my driver. At the highway entrance from my hometown to Wuhan, there was this guarded post. This picture was the moment my sister presented them with the travel pass. On the usually busy highway, we was only a car drive on it. It was eerie, as if the world was coming to an end. I arrived at Wuhan airport around 3 p.m. and departed the next morning around 5 a.m. In the airport, there were only evacuation flights and hundreds of evacuees. Nobody was there to maintain order, nor to provide any information. It was chaotic. People, including kids, were simply sleeping on any place possible, the cart, the bench. I dared not to take off my mask. I felt the virus everywhere, even in the air. After the long waiting, I felt hungry. There was only one place in the waiting area providing food. The only food it provided was instant noodles. I bought a box of instant noodles from the quiet corner and devoured the noodles facing the corner. I ate all the eggs my mother cooked for me from home and told myself, this made be my last meal before landing. More than 12 hours of waiting in the waiting area, we will finally give a rest band that had a number on it. On my boarding pass, there was no name, just the number matched up with the number on my rest band. I got my ID and the temperature checks and I was guided into the boarding area. Another, after another couple of hours waiting in the boarding area, there was a final round of temperature and ID checks right before boarding. At this time, most of us has been waiting for over two hours without proper water, food, and the rest. The temporary check made me nervous. I didn't know if I was infected during the long waiting. Had I gotten infected and I developed a fever, I would be denied body. Fortunately, my temperature was good and I was allowed to board the aircraft. It was such a relief the moment I walked into the aircraft cabin. But my feeling of relief didn't last long. The air aircraft was a cargo jet. Inside the aircraft, you can see that the cabin didn't have any interior decoration. Luggage was put on one side and the temporary seats were on the other side. The boats and the railways holding the aircraft together were visible, making me feel that it would fall apart in the air before it could carry us to our destination. And no destination was announced. We didn't know where we were flying to. Trash cans like this were fastened to the floor by stripes. This was my first time seeing this kind of trash can on an aircraft. In the tail of the cabin, there was a temporary quarantine place. It was also a temperature check place. Each of us went to check our temperature every two to three hours. Halfway through our flight, a woman with her two children was put in there in isolation. 
every one of us understood what that could mean. The air in the cabin suddenly became tense. When the aircraft was landed, we were ordered to stay in our seats, letting the mother with her two children off first. Everyone sitting on the aisle seats moved their bodies away from the path to avoid body contact when they passed us by. A person in a hazmat suit holding her baby walked ahead. She was following the man with her luggage. It was just like Hollywood Harry movie. Part two, Air Force Base, California, escaping coronavirus. This was where 178 of us were quarantined for 14 days uh, from February 5th to February 19th the Travis Air Force Base in California. We flew for about 12 hours and landed in the early morning of February 5th. The sky was still dark. After lengthy procedures, a bus took us to a hotel about 10 minutes away. I found out where we were only after we arrived at the hotel. In the first couple of days of our arrival, because of jet lag and fear, most of us stayed in hotel rooms. I woke up in the first afternoon, looked out over my window and saw the trees. The fence separated me and some of the trees from the outside world. I wrote on this sketch, trees fall over white flowers out over my window. Trees inside and outside of the fence, roots connected. Even though I was confined in this hotel, I felt somehow that I was connected to the outside world. Outside of my window, I could also see facilities that provided the services for us. The past was for staff to come into our fenced area. We were not allowed to walk out of these fences. The CDC staff held daily meetings around 2 to 3 p.m. from the second day on. The meetings were always at these bleachers. These meetings were to provide provide the COVID, COVID information and to receive questions from us. After we landed, two more people de uh, developed fevers and were sent away. When staff told us that the woman and her two babies were not infected, the two people were also not infected. We all cheered up and uh, applauded. In the first couple of days of our quarantine, most of the people stayed in hotel rooms. But this girl went out and drew on the sidewalk alone. I was very happy to see anybody outside. I was especially happy to see her drawing. People walked around to avoid stepping on her drawings. Starting on the third day, there was one hour of outdoor activity time every day during our quarantine time. The CDC organized many activities and their staff and the volunteers played games with kids. On this one, they played zombies with the kids. After the first couple of days, more and more kids joined the activity time. 
Some of them love to climb on this tree in the backyard. Childhood is always carefree. There were these two boys, Nathan, seven years old, and his brother, Benny, five years old, who practiced the violin every day in their hotel room. One day, they played for CDC people in the hotel hallway. On February 14th, Valentine's Day, the CDC prepared gifts for us. The gifts were given, given to each of us when we did our routine morning temperature checks. Kids got more gifts, including books and toys. And the same day, I had also received a gift from my wife in New York. On Valentine's Day, the CDC also organized some activities. One of the activities was to provide materials for us to make a Valentine's Day greeting card. Indeed, love was the best comfort in isolation. Another activity organized by CDC on Valentine's Day was a concert. Nathan and Benny played the violin for us. One of the pieces they played was long, long ago. Two days before we ended our quarantine, people from the Diamond Princess crews were evacuated into a hotel about 500 yards away from ours in the early morning. This was the hotel they stayed in. The day they moved in, most of the people slid in hotel rooms during activity time. Story time during our daily outdoor activity was very popular. Among the kids, usually seven to eight kids would be there. But the day when them and the princess cruise people moved into the hotel next to ours, only one kid showed up for story time. Fourteen days came to, to an end. I said goodbye to Travers Air Force Base. It was a very unique experience. Part three, New York, relieving coronavirus. On February 19th, I came back to Manhattan and I reunited with my family. Less than one month later, on March 17th, New York City schools were shut down. That same morning, I walked downstairs and I saw one wheel of my son's bag was missing. On March 27th, New York was in COVID-19 crisis. The government was unable to have New York locked down as the Chinese government did to Wuhan. So they called it New York on pause. The streets were empty, but I had to go outside to get my son's violin fixed. At the entrance of West 92nd Street Central Park, I saw this dog walker. He and his dogs were in such high spirits which made me full of courage. If I were in China, there would be no way that I could have gone outside on the street. At the end of March, 
New Yorker was prepare, preparing for surge of COVID-19 cases. This field hospital was on the news. It was just a 15 minutes walking distance from my apartment. I stood on the sidewalk on 5th Avenue during the scene when people were put up the tents and the equipment. I sensed the atmosphere of war. On March 27th, New Yorkers started the citywide clap to cheer and clap for all essential workers by leaning out their windows, balconies, and fair escapes. Every day at 7 p.m., New Yorkers shoot up using pots, pans, tramps, whistles, whatever made a loud sound to cheer for about two minutes. Emily, my neighbor, shoot up right on time every day, bonging on a lead. My wife, my sons, and I use the pens to cheer for the essential workers from our windows. Friends in China sent us over 1,000 masks at the end of March. My wife and I walked around Manhattan sharing these masks with friends. On April 4th, this is a farmer's market across from Lincoln Center in Manhattan was in operation. It was the hardest time in New York City, and seeing this market and the people there was very encouraging. During the height of the New York COVID-19 crisis, Lauren and Fred insisted on cooking for homeless in their church. The church opened every Saturday through, through the crisis, providing food they cooked for people in need. I sent 100 masks they needed for the food distribution. Amherst Hospital in Queens, New York, was the epicenter within the epicenter of COVID-19 crisis of New York City. In the very beginning of the New York COVID crisis, on March 24th, 13 people died of COVID in this hospital within 24 hours. The medical examiner's office had to station a street, uh, on street a refrigerated trailer to act as a makeshift morgue to store the bodies. Patients were dying in the emergency room, still waiting for a bed. Just as Amherst Hospital, Brooklyn Hospital Center was also nested in a residential area. The hospital doors were on narrow, busy streets. People could often see a horrible picture like this from their cars or their apartment windows. My son Max 3D printed face shield holders at home for donation. New York hospital were in shortage of everything for COVID-19. He printed over a hundred in total and delivered them to the organizers. In this drawing, he was exchanging 3D printing experience with them. Manson Rex was in our orchestra during New York COVID-19 crisis. He had, he had online rehearsals from home. It, it was very difficult. Eventually, his music school had to cancel the rehearsals. 
it was a hard time for everyone, but especially hard for the inter entertainment industry. Today is Rex's birthday. He is 12. He is in a summer camp far away. Happy birthday, Rex. I love you. Masks were in a dire shortage. People started to make them at home. My friend Ricky made masks using an antique sewing machine from her mother. Many very creative masks were made during that period of time. It was beautiful to see New Yorkers, people living in the art center, using their artistic talents to, to fight the pandemic. During April, the only morning noises I could hear from my living room were from sanitation trucks. In this picture, Philip and his partner were collecting garbage bags in front of my apartment building. They were among the very few who were on the streets during that time period. In late April, my primary doctor started to see patients again. On April 23rd, after visiting him, I went to visit the Wall Street Bowl, not too far away from his office. Usually this bowl is always surrounded by people and there is always a long line for taking a photo with the bowl. But on that day, it was perfect to take a photo with the ball along. During New York COVID-19 crisis, restaurants and many shops were shut down. Food delivery became the lifeblood of New Yorkers. For a long period of time, delivery guys were among the most of the same people on New York City streets. This fountain is in movies all the time, 26 feet high and 96 feet wide, one of the largest in New York City. It's a symbol of Central Park. On top of the statue is the angel of the waters who use water to heal. Ironically, on May 2nd, there was no water she could use to heal when the city was in crisis. In 1985, Strawberry Falls was built in Central Park as a living memorial to John Leyland. Two blocks away was his apartment compound, where he was shot in 1980. In the early afternoon of April 25th, a bride and her groom with masks walked through the mosaic with the word imagine. I was very moved to see this. Love always wins over fear. Above are part of my 100 sketches of my COVID-19 pandemic experience. I plan to publish them as a memoir. The tentative title of the book is Escaping Coronavirus. I would, I would love to do another presentation when the book is published. Thank you very much for listening to my story. Wish all of you safe and healthy. Thank you again. Thank you so much for coming to speak with us um, about your story and about your drawings. And um, we would love to have you back when your book is published. Um, we can do a book club meeting with your book and then we can um, discuss it with you. We would really love that. So um, please get back in touch when your book is published. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'd love to open the floor for any um, questions 
mm -hmm. or um, if you just oh. want to chat about yeah. something. So feel free to write in the chat if you have any questions or if you just want to talk. <laughs> Mm -hmm. okay. um, we did have one correct question from Lawrence who okay. asked um, how it is in New York right now. Okay. Um, so if you just want to talk about how it's like in New York right now, maybe you can say a few words. <laughs> okay. And Lawrence asked the how is the New York City right now? Mm, I would say it's almost back to normal. People I knew were all uh, vaccinated. Mm. The bars are full. People are watch Euro soccer games on the street. Yeah. Mm. Restaurants are full. I think around my apartment, the streets. Mm. Supermarket are crowded right now. Yeah. And the uh, subway trains are not very mm, yeah, uh, crowded. But it's not easy to keep social distance. Mm. Uh, some said New York City would never go back, but I didn't think so. It seems that I'm right. Yeah. That's, that's his question. Yeah. Hello? Hi. Hi. You know, I am very impressed by your art and uh, I don't have a, a question. I just want to like, you know, give some feedback. Okay. It's, a, it's a very nice presentation and um, many pictures are very touching and personal. And I think like, you know, particularly like, you know, the, uh, the way how you observe people's lives in this uh, difficult time, like, you know, it gives, uh, uh, gives hope, it gives encouragement and expresses the sorrow and the solitude and that, that those parts are really, really like, you know, uh, touching to me. I think the memory and the, from the beginning, how you uh, picture, uh, you know, the, the farewell from your mom and those details, uh, if you can like, you know, continue to add more, those are valuable. And, um, you know, the, 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 the location like a parking lot and you know, just a very, it's a very unique and it's very like authentic. I think like, you know, throughout there are more like in the pictures, just like in those parts, uh -huh, you, you can, you know, even illustrate more when you write your books. That's my personal opinion. It's very nice. Okay, thank you. Um, so we do have another question. Um, in what way has this experience changed you? Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. I, I believe in I believe in love more. I think yeah, it's my story. Yes. Uh, yeah, uh, can you please give me your comments, your feedback about my pictures? Thank you. Um, so we do have one more question. Um, do you know anyone who got COVID in China or New York? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, actually, I... Mm, in China, my, some of my uh, relatives have got the COVID in my hometown, yeah. But uh, also all of them are, are recovered, yeah. Mm. But I think uh, I know more people in New York got the COVID-19, yeah. At least I know my, my friends around, I think more than 10, I know them got the COVID. Yeah. 
Um, Emily wants to know when your book will be published. Uh, I think I have a plan maybe uh, earlier next year. Yeah, the book will be published. I hope so, yes. I, when I see you work on the book. Um, I thought you're, oh, um, Pierre wants to know how is um, the Delta variant in New York and China? Um, do you think the Delta variant will cause the same chaos as in 2020? Mm. Mm. Uh, China, I, I haven't heard, but I don't think uh, I don't think so in here, New York, New York City. Yeah. Um, we have another question. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. you can go ahead. <clears throat> um, Emily asks, do you think your experience has affected how you are handling moving back to quote unquote normal life? Mm -hmm. Normal life. Um, I think um, uh, the, the COVID-19 is a uh, unique experience for me. But um, uh, not a very much, maybe, maybe more, uh, uh, maybe more cause. Yeah, I think more more careful. I mean, after that. Um, we do have one question from, well, from my mother, actually. Um, <laughs> anyway, can you share with us where you learned to draw so beautifully? Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. Mm. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? Um, where did you learn how to draw so beautifully? Oh, okay. Actually, when I was uh, when I was nine years old, I started to draw with my teacher in uh, in my hometown, Zhongxiang, uh, Hubei, with my teacher. Yeah. Actually, after my uh, graduation from the university, actually my major is interior design, but I still drawing, and I have a studio in flashing and uh, in my heart yeah sometimes i still drawing the drawings and the, some painting yeah um so there is another question from pierre and um just as a reminder you don't have to answer all the questions but um do you think people will continue to wear masks and social distance even after the pandemic is long gone? Or do you think people will be happy to find their pre-COVID life again with no masks and no social distancing? I think the people need, need to recover. I, I think the, the people need to time to gradually to uh, get to the normal life. I think maybe for one year, one year, I think, I guess, yeah. But right now in New York, I just outside the street, I think just 50, Around the fifty per percent people still wear a mask. Not all of them, but in the bus and the, uh, and the train, I think the people still wear a mask. Yeah.
Are there any other questions? Well, um, just my feedback to your um, art and to your writing or your story. I think that your art is beautiful. Um, I thought your story was really moving. And I think that the combination of the pictures with your narration is also very effective. So I really, um, I'm really looking forward to reading the book um, and definitely going to, definitely going to order that when it comes out. And um, yeah, I think that um, you have a very valuable story here that is um, very important also for people to hear. So thank you very much for sharing your story and for allowing us to look at your drawings as a little sneak preview. And um, again, I'm looking forward to reading the book. <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Anya. Thank you for your organize this uh, this uh, events and uh, giving me this opportunity to show my artworks. Yeah, artworks. Of course, we're looking forward to hosting you again when your book comes out. And um, I think if there are no more questions, if you have um, any more questions um, afterwards, you can also email the API caucus. Um, um, and I hope that all of you will read Moonway's book when it comes out. And I wish you a great Saturday evening. And um, thanks everyone for coming. And thank you again for sharing um, for sharing your story. Have a great evening, everyone.